Tejpal Bhatia, Chief Revenue Officer with Axiom Space. Uh, welcome to Australia and Space TV uh, here on the lawns of the Broadmoor at the Fort of this Space uh, Symposium. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, now, we've had uh, Koichi Wakata on previously on Australia and Space, so it's great to have the CRO uh, here. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about the business. I think uh, our audience should know Axiom Space. The whole world should know about Axiom Space, to be honest. Maybe introduce us to Axiom Space and where you're currently at. And then we'll talk about some of the announcements that are coming out this week at the Space Symposium. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. You know, Koichi is a superstar. Yeah, uh, that's right. You know, following him is a tough act. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I sometimes say, you know, he's the brains on the face. Great, nice. <laughs> but really, it's the opposite. Fair uh, enough. He's the brains and the face. Very uh, good. So Axiom Space is building the first commercial space station. Uh, we are developing our modules currently that will attach to the current International Space Station yep. and will detach before the ISS is retired, becoming a commercial freestanding platform. Yep. And that's always been the strategy for preventing any sort of gap in low Earth orbit and creating a low Earth orbit economy. So what we've been doing in addition to developing our station is sending missions up to the ISS. Uh, we've done three so far, AX1 through 3. and soon we'll be doing AX4 yeah. as well happy to talk more about that and we've also been building the spacesuit that the next humans yes, on the moon Prada. will be wearing yeah. yeah so our three main business lines are stations our missions and our spacesuits but a way you can also think about it is us as a space infrastructure company and all the capabilities necessary to maintain human life in space. Yep. And when you look at that stack, it's everything from the station to the missions to the suits and several other things like data, communication, manufacturing, everything will need to sustain life and thrive as an economy and a species off planet. Well, I think it's a, an indication, there's at least three announcements that we can discuss today. And I think, it is, as you say, uh, the Prada suit was uh, launched at IAC in Milan uh, last year as well. Uh, and given the, the at the stack, as you as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot more announcements to come. So Axiom's definitely one to be watching on an ongoing basis. Uh, orbital data centres, uh, I think the nodes one and two are due for launch later this year, no, no set date. Maybe talk us through uh, the ODCs and how you've got here and maybe some of the uh, collaborators as well. Correct. Uh, so we're very excited about this announcement. Uh, we announced at uh, Space Symposium this week yep. that later this year we'll be launching the first two nodes of our orbital data center network. Simply put, it's a data center in space. Yep. Uh, the network is that it's multiple nodes. And the way we look at our orbital data center network is what we call a heterogeneous network, as opposed to a homogeneous. Yeah. The first two nodes are identical. Uh, they're satellites and it's providing commute, uh, compute and communication, but our modules on our station are also nodes. Right. And as you think about how the network expands, there can be bespoke nodes with specific capabilities, whether that's maintaining, maintaining human life, or doing 3D printing of materials, yeah. or recycling, or advanced manufacturing of materials for further industrial development here on Earth. They all are potential nodes on the network, all connected through the data center, all connected to the station, all connected to the ground. Right. And that as one layer of the foundational infrastructure is very important to us. Is there anything fundamentally different uh, in terms of a normal data center other than it being in space? Is there anything specific on the design or, or the equipment that needs to be space tested obviously, but you've been testing some of this equipment already. But I understand you know, the ISS have been running on laptops and, uh, and other computer towers for some years anyway. So yeah, anything specifically different? Yeah, it's it's interesting you should ask. So the, the fundament, fundamental difference is it's in orbit yeah. as opposed to on the ground. But there's some also very counterintuitive advantages of that for Earth. In many cases, the closest data center to you will be up. Yeah, right. Okay. Not in major cities, yeah. obviously, yeah. Uh, but around the world. That actually might be the lowest latency AI compute power some you have. Some 400 kilometers. And, exactly. Yeah. So I think there's a very powerful um, position for data in general Yep. Uh, for Earth. The other fundamental difference is now it's bringing uh, the compute to the data as opposed to the data to the compute. So all the experimentation and stuff being done on station today yes. takes a long time for that data to come back down, be analyzed, uh, and provide real-time feedback to the scientists yep. and the engineers and the entrepreneurs who are working on it. So orbital data centers improve that time, uh, yep. cycle time, from months to milliseconds, nanoseconds. 
Does it open up a range of services for other people as well, other, other users to say, look, we want to start testing some uh, processing up in space and see whether that's different? I mean, is, is the microgravity uh, environment, does it change anything in terms of the CPU or the GPU usage and the like? Or yes. power usage? Is yes, there and that's usage? exactly right. Yeah. The power. That's yeah. going to be the limiting constraint no matter what. And yeah. before, I would very easily be able to say unequivocally that's going to be the uh, limiting uh, factor in space. But now we can also say that here on Earth. Yeah. As data centers take up more and more power yeah. and AI becomes more and more powerful and prevalent, the limiting factor on Earth will also be power. Well, we mentioned uh, there's also some, you've done some recent testing as well with payload power and thermal modules. I suppose that's a, a link, but all this is all still related, right? Correct. So, uh, recent announcement that we've changed our sequencing for station, our first module that will be going up, we're calling it the PPTM, yep. uh, payload power thermal uh, module. And this resequencing was very important for multiple reasons, but actually does accelerate our schedule. Uh, what it also does is that limiting factor, what's going to be the, the challenge for power. It's forcing us from a constraint standpoint and a trade-off standpoint to understand that the power necessary to maintain human life and the power necessary to maintain a data center, they're a trade-off, but they're not mutually exclusive. So thinking again of Axiom as a space infrastructure company and that stack, while there is maintaining life for us to actually make progress and thrive, we're gonna need that data center infrastructure. Yeah. And whether that's on that same module using that same power or it's augmented through this heterogeneous network where the module itself is part of that node, all of a sudden you can bring the power of advanced compute and modern AI yeah. in a distributed and edge uh, infrastructure and network architecture that can also leverage digital twins on Earth and all the universities and labs and agencies working on experimentation here, running 30,000 simulations overnight. The 0.01% that are the most likely to be successful are managed up there by astronauts or robots. Yep. And that data is in real time being fed back into the digital twin. We're going to see drug development and manufacturing, yeah. everything that's been developed over the last several decades as a real business and value creator this decade. Well, some of the collaborators, there's Kepler, AWS, Red Hat, uh, some, and I'm sure there's some others as well. Um, and maybe that does a good segue to X4 as well in terms of humans in flight. Maybe uh, where's that currently at? Uh, and uh, yeah, just the progressions for uh, their launch. Sure, so the, the announcement for Orbital Data Center this week was about our partnership with Kepler yep. for nodes one and two. The origin of the Orbital Data Center business for Axiom actually goes back to our first mission, AX1, where we partnered and collaborated with uh, AWS and we sent a machine up and we've worked with them on every single mission going up, running demos on the missions, but actually utilizing that hardware and that infrastructure for running compute payloads from the ground up in space, yep. not necessarily tied to missions. What's coming up uh, this spring, later this spring, is our AX4 mission. So AX1 was our first all civilian mission. That was when we also sent several uh, commercial collaborators like Amazon. AX2 was our first national mission with the Saudi government. They yep. sent uh, a man and a woman up uh, on that mission. Our third mission, AX3, was the first all national, all European mission. Yep. Italy, Turkey, and Sweden. AX4 is also an all national mission with India, Hungary and Poland. Yeah. Poland through the European Space Agency, which was also on AX3. So the excitement for this mission is showing the progress and the increased demand from nations all over the world, uh, but also this continuing collaboration with commercial partners and orbital data centers being a major part of it on our missions, on ISS, and now through this additional infrastructure of the ODC network. And it is a, it is it does create that international aspect and you are creating astronaut opportunities uh, around the globe, right? That's very much yeah. so. What we've seen over the four missions is more nations that have never had access to the ISS yeah. have now gone up. So particularly with AX4, you can't write this. It's just, you know, uh, India, Poland, and Hungary are all sending their first citizens to the ISS. Yep. Coincidentally, they're all sending their second astronaut to space, coincidentally, all 40 years after their first astronauts right. went up. So I'm getting goosebumps just even telling yeah. that story. Like, this is an incredible time to be alive. And the amount of people, young girls and boys, are going to be impacted on this mission, and it's commanded by Dr. Peggy Whitson, Axiom Commander, her second mission with us. It's just phenomenal. Yeah.
Well, we mentioned we started this interview with uh, Koichi Wakata. So again, uh, full circle uh, yeah. in terms of the pedigree uh, that Axiom now has uh, with the, interna uh, the International Space Station as it is and uh, what the ISS will be uh, once Axiom sort of takes over and starts adding its own modules. Uh, Tej Paul Bhatia, the Chief Revenue Officer with Axiom Space here at the Broadmoor at the 40th Space Symposium. Absolute pleasure. Hopefully we'll get an opportunity to speak to you again uh, soon. But thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Thank you so much for having me.